Greetings, everybody. Turn your King James Bible to Jeremiah chapter 25. This is the continuation of the Jeremiah Commentary Series. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus is that light of life. So, let's get going here on Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Now, remember, the prior king of Babylon had sent an emissary to the king of Israel, and the king of Israel showed him all the gold and the temple and the king's treasure and everything. So I guess that king, I'm sure, told Nebuchadnezzar about it. So here it is, Nebuchadnezzar decides, well, I'm, I feel like getting some gold, so I'm going to go hit Jerusalem. So... Uh, that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the which Jeremiah the prophet spake unto all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, From the thirteenth year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even unto this day, that is the three and twentieth year, the word of the Lord hath come unto me, and I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye have not hearkened. Yeah, I got up early. I told you, but did you listen? No. Uh-uh. Verse 4. And the Lord hath sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened, nor inclined your ear to hear. They said... Who said? The prophets. They said, Turn ye again, every one from his evil way, and from the evil of your doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord hath given unto you and to your fathers forever and ever. And go not after other gods to serve them, and to worship them, and provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands and I will and I will do you no hurt you think the Lord likes uh, people worshiping Satan I don't think so verse 7 yet ye have not hearkened unto me did you listen no yet ye have not hearkened unto me saith the Lord that ye might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because ye have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. Did you know that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, was the Lord's servant? He was. Just like Satan. Satan serves a purpose in God's plan. That's why he's still around. You know, the Satanists actually think that uh, God is unable to kill Satan. And that's why Satan's still around. They actually believe that. Believe it or not, they do. Well, that's what Satan tells them, I guess. But uh, the fact of the matter is, Satan serves a purpose in God's plans right now. When Satan no longer serves a purpose in God's plans, he will be summarily gotten rid of. 
So, Jeremiah 25, 9, Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and an hissing and perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of the millstones and the light of the candle. This and this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. 70 years. Now remember, every seventh year was to be a Sabbath. So there's going to be 10 years of Sabbaths, or 10 Sabbath, 10 Sabbaths. Well, let's see. Yeah, every, yeah, something like that. I, if I got to, let me take a look at the Jubilee real quick. Uh, I had to look it up, but uh, from what I understand, the Jubilee is every 50 years. Why 70 years? Honestly, I'm not sure. I just know that, uh, you know, every seventh days there was a, was the Sabbath day. The seventh day was supposed to be the Sabbath day. So 70 years. Uh, all, well, also... Um, in the seventh year, you were supposed to let the land lie fallow. You know, you weren't supposed to plant any more new crops. Just let the land sit. Uh, what you might do is plant a cover crop. Uh, for example, beans and uh, clover and some other things. Uh, from what I understand, they extract nitrogen from the air and put it into the ground which is very beneficial for uh, the plants. Uh, perhaps you've seen NPK fertilizer. N is nitrogen, P, phosphorus, and then K is potassium, if I remember my chemistry correctly. Uh, I was a water guy, not a soil guy, but uh, those were the three main chemical compounds that plants use for growth. So every seventh year, the um, you were supposed to let the land sit, and it would help rejuvenate the land. Uh, I actually know about some farmers, not personally, but I've read about them, about some farmers that actually did this, and they said, yeah, it, it really works. And, of course, the Lord promised a bumper crop in the sixth year, that you'd have food for two years. So it's an act of faith to uh, in the trust in the Lord to say, well, I'm not going to plant any crops and, you know, we're going to have a, a Sabbath for the land for a year. Uh, you could plant something, but you don't harvest it. You just let it plow it under, I guess, or burn the field or whatever. Burning the fields uh, releases all that... Uh, I guess you could say uh, all the plant materials back into the soil. Believe it or not, yeah, burning the fields was actually good. It killed all the bad bugs. Uh, so I've been studying a little bit about agriculture. I know just enough to be dangerous, you know. So, verse 11, And this whole land shall be de a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon, 70 years. So that's a jubilee and 20. And uh, 10, 10 years of Sabbaths for the land. 
And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolations. Guess what? Babylon in the book of Isaiah was to be a habitation for dragons and owls and uh, the devils, you know, it was never to be rebuilt. Never. It says, neither would the Arabian pitch his tent there. I guess I need to show you that. But guess what? Saddam Hussein was going to rebuild Babylon. Well, guess what? That didn't work out. Lord said, it ain't going to happen. All right, that is in uh, Isaiah 13 and verse 19. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 20. It shall never be inhabited. Now, that's a prophecy. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there. Arabs are not going to be living there. They're not going to even pitch their tent there. Neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. I had a buddy, kind of, sort of, that I worked with. He was from Morocco. He was a, a Muslim, very, very lukewarm Muslim. Uh, but uh, he told me, he says, I, well, I, I wasn't a believer then, but I remember him saying that uh, there was a legend among the uh, Muslims in Islam, that uh, the de devil spirits, the demons, or whatever you want to call them, the devils, inhabited, destroy Babylon, and that they would torture anybody that uh, would dare uh, pitch their tent there or whatever. I don't know how true that was, but I found that interesting. I, I mean, I didn't even believe in any of this stuff back when he was telling me this stuff. Uh, I picked his brain on some stuff about Islam because uh, I, I knew just enough to think uh, this was some crazy stuff. But he was a decent guy. I liked him. We used to drive to work together. And uh, his mother used to make some really good food. And, you know, they were hospitable people. I liked, you know, I liked them. But uh, it's funny he mentioned that. So the Bible says it shall never be inhabited, Babylon. Neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there. Neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. So nobody's going to go there. You know, nobody's going to spend the night there in a tent. Nobody's going to, you know, nobody's going to take their herds and graze there. Verse 21. But wild beast of the desert shall lie there. And their houses shall be full of doleful creatures, and owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. So what's a doleful creature? Adjective. Uh, Webster's 1828. Sorrowful, expressing grief. Um, sad, afflicted, dismal. Sorrow, gloomy, you get the idea. Um, satyrs, S-A-T-Y-R-S. I am, I am not sure about that. I mean, according to Greek mythology, a satyr was a half man, half goat thing. Perhaps you've heard of the god Pan. From the waist down, it was a goat. And from the waist up, it was a man. 
But that's if you believe Greek mythology. Webster says that in um, uh, the Greek, it's a monkey or a fawn. Uh, now, let's face it. At the uh, we could I could have been taught wrong about the satyr being a you know half man half goat thing. I mean, look at a unicorn. You know, they got a horse with a horn coming out of its forehead. But guess what? You know what a unicorn is? The Asian rhino. It has one uni, which means one corn. Uh, and it's even called the Unicornus rhinoceros, as opposed to the African rhino that has two horns. So when did a Asian rhino with one horn become a horse with a, you know, a, a, with a, a, a horn? I mean, you know, come on. So I don't know. They've... Uh, the powers that be have uh, infiltrated and destroyed our knowledge for a long, long time. So a satyr could be a monkey or a fawn, as far as I know. So let's see. And uh, it says, And the wild beasts of the islands shall cry in their desolate houses, and dragons, dragons, in their pleasant palaces, and her time is near to come, and her days shall not be prolonged. Now I find it interesting that in verse 17 of Isaiah 13, it even says that, Behold, I will stir, stir up the meads, against them the Medes and the Persians which shall not regard silver and as for gold they shall not delight in it and guess what happened later you know who destroyed the Babylonian Empire the Medes and the Persians and if you want to know where they are on the present day map, that would be Iran, the territory of Iran. And they were kind enough to allow Judah to return to Jerusalem and to rebuild it. But the you know who's, they want to destroy the Persians or the remnants of the Persians. So, I don't know. All right, let's go back to Jeremiah 25, verse 12. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolations. Just like Isaiah 13 says, right? Verse Jeremiah 25 and verse 13. And I will bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced against it, even all that is written in this book which Jeremiah hath prophesied against all the nations. For many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of them also, and I will recompense them according to their deeds and according to the works of their own hands. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. The cup of fury, the wine cup of fury. You know, in the book of Revelation, it's called the uh, cup of wrath. What's the difference between fury and wrath? Not much, if you ask me. So, 
Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. And they shall drink and be moved and be mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Then I took the cup at the Lord's hand and made all the nations to drink to whom the Lord had sent me. All right, a companion verse in Jeremiah would be 51 and verse 7. Babylon hath been a golden cup, a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. And when you're saying the nations are mad, it doesn't mean they're angry. doesn't mean they're PO'd. Uh-uh. It means they're crazy. They're insane. Spiritually, that is. Huh. So Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand, made all the earth drunken. And the nations have drunken of her wine. Huh. Turn to Revelation chapter 17, verse 1. We're going to take a look at this. All right, 17.1, Revelation. And there came out of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment the judgment of the great whore, the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Isn't this what we just read? Yeah. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, royalty colors, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Huh. So. And you know what? Let me tell you something. Everybody's so quick to point out, oh, that's Rome, that's Rome. Well, how was was God ever married to Rome? No. How can you be a whore if you've never been, you know, a bride? If you ask me, it makes more sense Jerusalem. And everybody will say, oh, well, you know, Rome's on seven hills, just like, you know. But so is Jerusalem. Jerusalem, end time Jerusalem, has to be the great whore. Because she was where the bride was at one time. But now she's become a whore. 
And everybody will say, oh, yeah, well, you know, it was a Roman Catholic Church that killed everybody. Uh, that's not what my Bible says. That is not what my Bible says at all. The blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And they're quick to tell you, oh yeah, Rome killed a bunch of Christians. Uh, that's not what my Bible says. I mean, I'm not denying they did. But that's not what my Bible says. Who killed Stephen? The Roman Catholic Church? No. Who killed Jesus? Wasn't Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate tried to release Jesus. Who killed the prophets? Wasn't Rome. Who killed the apostles? It wasn't Rome. You don't believe me, do you? Well, let's take a look. How about uh, Book of John 1912? And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. Who is him? Jesus. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. Does that sound like Rome killed Jesus? Uh, no. How about the King James Bible, book of John, chapter 5 and verse 16? And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Hmm. How about John 5, 18? Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, Jesus, because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. John chapter 7, verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. But Chaplain Bob, it was Rome. Well, you got a different Bible than I do. Acts 9, 23. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. Who? Paul. I think. Yeah, I think it was Paul. Acts 23, 12. And, it was, and when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bowed themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. But Paul's a false apostle, Chaplain Bob. I mean, I, I attended the Hebrew Roots, and they told me this. Uh, maybe the Hebrew Roots people are the heretics and not Paul. What do you think? That's what I think. My King James Bible says they wanted to kill Paul. Well, they couldn't kill him, so they're just going to try to discredit his writings. Anybody that denies Paul denies the one that sent Paul, and that was Jesus. And if you deny Jesus, you deny the one that sent Jesus, which is God the Father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Acts 26, one, uh, 21. For these causes, the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Huh. Paul in 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 14 through 16. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. Who killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets? Take a guess. Even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins all way. 
for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Ooh. Does that sound like Rome killed everybody? Uh, I don't think so. The Bible tells you who killed the prophets. And it wasn't Rome. They didn't even exist. The Vatican didn't even exist. But in Revelation 18.24, it says, And in her, speaking of Babylon, And in her was found the blood of prophets. Well, it was, you know, it was the you-know-whos that killed the prophets. And in her, Babylon, was found the blood of the prophets, the blood of prophets and of the saints, and of all that were slain upon the earth. Spiritually, Babylon was responsible for the blood of the prophets. Revelation 16, 6, For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Revelation 17, 6, You know, we just read that. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Who killed the prophets? Well, how about we talk to Jesus? Well, listen to Jesus, not talk to him. But you, Well, you should talk to him in prayer. But Who killed the prophets? Go to Luke 13.33. Jesus said, Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. But Chaplain Bob, it was Rome. No, you're an idiot. If you're going to tell me Rome, you're either deceived or you're a deceiver. Jesus said, For it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. The prophets were killed in Jerusalem by the people of Jerusalem. How about Jesus in Matthew 23, 37? O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. What? O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. It doesn't say, O Vatican City, Vatican City, you that kill the prophets people of Jesus. No. It says, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stoneth them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wing, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. In Revelation 11, 8, speaking of the two witnesses, the two witnesses in the end times, one of them is going to be Elijah. It says, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And then they'll say, Oh, that was Rome. What? Was Jesus crucified in Rome? Oh no, Chaplain Bob, they, the, the Romans crucified Jesus, so technically it was Rome. Uh, but my Bible says that Pilate sought to release him. Oh, 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 that's because you use that King James Bible. That's wrong. Yeah, yeah. Now, are you starting to get the idea? Jesus, my Lord, was crucified in Jerusalem, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Not in Rome, not in Mecca, not in the USA. And all these people that say Rome or Mecca or the USA is Mystery Babylon are deceived or they're deceivers. I mean, I can't help it. Now, I'm not denying that Rome killed Christians. They did. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was because of Rome that uh, William Wycliffe died. He was responsible for a great deal of responsibility for the King James Bible in English. They used his um, a lot of his work when you know putting together the um, King James. Matthew twenty three thirty four. 
Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them ye shall scourge in your Catholic churches? No. And some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Archias, whom he slew between the temple and the altar. Jesus is tracing them all the way back to somebody that killed, that shed the blood of righteous Abel. Think about that. Oof. You know, think about it. I mean, really. And then people will tell you, oh, well, yeah, it's Rome. You're idiots. They're idiots. Don't listen to them. They're deceived or they're deceivers. Jeremiah 25, 15. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, take the wine cup of this fury at my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. And they shall drink and be moved and be mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Then took I the cup at the Lord's hand and made all the nations to drink unto whom the Lord had sent me. To wit, Jerusalem and the cities of Judah. Who drank the cup? To wit, Jerusalem and the cities of Judah and the kings thereof and the princes thereof to make them a desolation and astonishment and hissing. What hisses? Snakes and a curse as it is this day. Let's go to uh, Revelation 14 real quick. Uh, verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Now that's not me repeating. This is, it actually says this in the Bible. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Why does it say Babylon is fallen, is fallen? Why twice? Well, Babylon, physical Babylon fell. It was never to be inhabited again, remember? The Arabian wasn't going to pitch their tent there. The shepherds weren't going to have their flocks there, their herds. Physically, Babylon fell. Well, the second time it falls, it's destroyed this spiritually. So physical Babylon, carnal Babylon fell. And now, spiritual Babylon fell. Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Verse 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his right hand, uh, or in his hand. People, the Bible says in, not on. In. If I took poison and put it on my hand or put it on my stomach, I'd be fine. If I took poison and put it in my stomach, I got a problem. There's a big difference between in and on. 
And I trust the King James with my life. Because you know what? When I was a baby in Christ and the Lord, he showed me that this Bible is true. He showed me that. And I believe him. If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, full strength, people, industrial strength, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, the cup of his indignation, extreme hatred, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God, I believe it's two commandments. Jesus broke them down to two commandments. Love the Lord and love thy neighbor. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You know, Satan doesn't care if you keep the commandments if you don't have the faith of Jesus. And you can believe in Jesus, but if you don't love the Lord and don't love your neighbor, what good is it? Revelation 16. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup, the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Boy, that's going to be one, one earthquake, huh? All right, let's go to back to Jeremiah 25. So I hope you um, got something out of that cup study there. You know, Babylon is, uh, there's a, uh, a book called The Babylonian Tall, T-A-L-L, -L, Mud, M-U-D. Take those two words, put them together, and then delete an L. And that word means learning. So it's Babylonian learning, or learning from Babylon. It's the opinion of a certain group of religious leaders. I won't say that word because probably, uh, yeah. All right, verse 19. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and his servants, and his princes, and all his people, and all the mingled people, and all the kings of the land of Uz, and all the kings of the land of the Philistines, and Ashkelon, and Azah, and Ekron, and the remnant of Ashdod. Now these are all Ham and Canaanites descendants. The Philistines were the giants. And uh, yeah, the Canaanites were uh, satanic human hybrids. From Genesis 6, Job 38. Boy, you can hardly find any churches that even teach that anymore. But, you know, there's a reason why God said to go in and kill them all. He didn't say preach to them. No, he said go in and kill them all. 
That's why people freak out when they read the Old Testament. And God says, go in there to this city and kill everything that breathes. Men, women, children, kill them all. Well, that's the Bob paraphrase, but that's essentially what he said. But you think you, you you'd think the uh, they would teach what happened in Genesis six? You know, no, they wouldn't. No, that's that cruel God of the Old Testament. Oh yeah, he's that he's that mean, terrible, evil God. But now we got Jesus, and he's totally changed. Well, the Bible says. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I think it's in Malachi. It says, I am the Lord. I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. I hope I'm not paraphrasing that too bad. But Verse 20. And all the mingled people. Why would they say mingled people? And all the kings of the land of Uz and all the kings of the land of Philistines. Goliath was a Philistine, remember that. And Ashkelon, and Ahaz, and Ekron, and the remnant of Ashdod, Edom. God never says anything good about Edom. Matter of fact, God pronounces the doom of Edom. And Moad, and the children of Ammon. The Bible says that an Ammonite and a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Not even to the 10th generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord. But your preachers will say, oh, well, yeah, that was then. And now in the 11th generation, they can come in. But that's not what the Bible says. And that's found in Deuteronomy 23.3. An Ammonite or Moabite shall not, not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. Does that sound like the eleventh generation they can go in? Uh, and they'll tell you, well, you know, that's because Lot had incest incest with his daughters. Uh, it, no. No. The children probably had to have intermarried with the Canaanites. That's exactly what had to have happened had to have happened because I, they lived in that area i mean lot lived in the land of sodom and that was part of the canaanites territory so and then they'll tell you oh well ruth was a, a moabite and she was a descendant of jesus was she racially a moabite or did she live in the land of moab personally i think she lived in the land of Moab. I mean, I've lived in Florida almost all my life. Does that make me a Floridian? You know, if I move to Texas, does that make me a Texan? If I put on cowboy boots and a, a rattlesnake skin belt and a cowboy, a Stetson cowboy hat, does that make me a Texan? I don't know. I, you know, if I move to San Francisco, does that make me a, uh, never mind, never mind. I'm not going to go there. All right. Jeremiah 25 and verse 21, Edom, Moab and the children of Ammon and all the kings of Tyrus and all the kings of Zidon and the kings of the isles, which are beyond the sea, Dedan and Tima and Buz and all that are in the utmost corners. And all the kings of Arabia and all the kings of the mingled people and all the kings of the mingled people, mingled with who? That dwell in the desert. Uh, you want to read what the Lord says about mingled people. Uh, may I suggest you read Ezra chapter 9. Yeah, read Ezra chapter 9. And then you can read about the solution in Ezra chapter 10. So first here, Lord was talking about Egypt. And then he's talking about all these other places. Verse 25. And all the kings of Zimri and all the kings of Elam and all the kings of the Medes and all the kings of the north far and near one with another and all the kingdoms of the world which are upon the face of the earth and the king of Sheshach shall drink after them, Babylon, 
Therefore thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Drink ye, and be drunken, and spew. Have you ever drank too much, gotten drunk, and get the spins in bed and throw up? Well, I have. I have. I know exactly what it's talking about here. Drink ye, and be drunken, and spew, and fall, and rise no more because of the sword which I will send among you. And it shall be, if they refuse to take the cup at thine hand to drink, then shalt thou say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ye shall certainly drink. Oh, you think you're not going to drink? Oh yeah, you will. Trust me. Ye shall certainly drink. For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city, which is called by my name. Sorry, that's not Rome. Jerusalem's a city called by his name. For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city, which is called by my name. And should ye be utterly, unpun utterly unpunished, ye shall not be unpunished. For I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, saith the Lord of hosts. Uh, let's stop here for a second. Uh, I want you to think about this. Why would Satan want to rule from Vatican City? Wouldn't he rather rule from the city of God, the city of David, Jerusalem? Wouldn't that be the ultimate slap in the face to the Lord for Satan to rule from Jerusalem? Think about it. But they're going to try to trick you into thinking that their Messiah, when he comes, is... I, okay, I've got two, two theories here. One, they're going to try to trick all everybody into thinking that when the uh, Messiah comes, their Messiah comes, that it's even Christ returning. And the false prophet's going to be able to do miracles. That's theory number one. But the problem is, the Bible, Paul, Paul, who they try to discredit his writings, Paul says that uh, when Christ returns, every eye will see him, and we will be caught up in the air to meet him in the clouds. So, if you don't meet the Lord in the air, in the clouds, it's not the Christ that Paul wrote of. But some people think that uh, they're going to try to make us think that's the second coming of Christ. When the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, the beast, whatever you, by whatever word you want to use. But personally, my opinion is, the way I see things going, they're going to try to make everybody think that Jesus was a false prophet, a false Messiah, and that the Messiah that follows is the real Messiah. So they're going to try to make trick everybody into thinking Christ, Jesus, was the wrong Messiah, a false Messiah. And I'll guarantee you, almost the entire world's going to fall for it. Islam, uh, Judaism, of course. And if the Pope says it, how many millions of uh, Catholics will follow? And of course, your Buddhists and Hindus are going to fall right in line, no problem. And what's going to happen when your uh, TV preachers like uh, Kenneth Copeland and Benny Hinn and MacArthur or whoever, you know, all these people say that, uh, oh, here's the real Messiah. We, we were tricked. Jesus was, uh, Jesus was a fake, they'll say. What's going to happen? Especially when they don't disappear in the pre-trib rapture. And they find out that they're going to have to either die for their faith or deny Jesus. Ooh, you know, that's the, you know, 
Jesus warned us in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 that the false Messiah, the false Christ, would come before he does. But the pre-trib rapture liars tell us, oh, no, no, Jesus comes first. You know, and it's just unbelievable. I, I see why the Lord deceives these people. I really do. Paul warns us we're going to be changed at the last trump. Well, there's seven trumps in Revelation. And the seventh one is at the last one at the end of the tribulation. Oh, Chaplain Bob, you got it all mixed up. There's a there's a last trump before the tribulation. Where's that in the Bible? Ask them to show you. They can't because it doesn't exist. You know, they're going to end up denying Christ, trust me, to save their lives. And then Christ is going to deny them before the Father and his angels. He's going to say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. Probably the scariest words you'd ever hear in your life. Christ saying, I never knew you. Depart from me. To be cast into outer darkness. There shall be gnashing and uh, gnashing of teeth. No. Wow. Verse 29. Jeremiah 25, 29. For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city, which is called by my name. And should ye be utterly unpunished? Ye shall not be unpunished, for I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words, and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high, and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes, against all the inhabitants of the earth. You know, the book of Revelation talks about uh, the treading out, of, treading out of the winepress of the wrath of God. Yeah, it does. Verse 31. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind, whirlwind shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. Why won't anybody bury them? Because everybody's going to be dead. There's not going to be anybody left to bury them. Verse 34. Howl, ye shepherds, and cry, and wallow yourselves in the ashes, ye principal of the flock. For the days of your slaughter and of your dispersions are accomplished, and ye shall fall like a pleasant vessel. And when he's talking about shepherds here, I think he's talking about... Uh, the sheep, as in those that should be following the Lord. I don't think he's talking about shepherds that have four-legged animals, but. Verse 35. And the shepherd shall have no way to flee, nor the principal of a flock to escape. A voice of the cry of the shepherds and an howling of the principal of the flock shall be heard. For the Lord hath spoiled their pasture. And the peaceable habitations are cut down because of the fierce anger of the Lord. He hath forsaken his covert as a lion, for their land is desolate because of the fierceness of the oppressor and because of his fierce anger. And that, everybody, is the end of Jeremiah 25. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.